on this computer. Okay, so just for the benefit of the recording, I'll do the introductions again. Uh, welcome to the Medac Research Network quarterly meeting. I'm Hila Akid, uh, Medac's Research Manager, and we're really excited to have Ilana Moldavin and Christine Mitchell from Human Impact Partners, uh, a US-based health justice organization, um, joining us today to talk about how research can be um, accountable, useful, and uh, and uh, ethical in terms in relation to the communities it seeks to serve. So I'll introduce them now. Um, Elana is a senior research associate at Human Impact Partners, where her work focuses on advancing economic security through collaborative, community-centered research. She believes that policy advocacy, community organizing, and participatory research are powerful tools in service of health and racial equity. Alana holds a Master of Public Health from the University of California, Berkeley, and an undergraduate degree in sociology from Occidental College. And Alana is going to, I think, present their principles from Human Impact Partners' new-ish now research code of ethics. And then we're going to hear an example of how these principles can be applied in practice, I believe, from Christine Mitchell. Um, Christine is a research project director with uh, the Health Instead of Punishment program at Human Impact Partners. Um, she's an organizer with the Boston-based Deeper Than Water Coalition and a co-author of the incredible American Public Health Association policy statements on law enforcement, violence, and carceral systems. Um, she has a Master of Divinity from Harvard Divinity School and a Doctor of Science in Social and Behavioral Sciences from Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. So over to you guys. Okay, thank you. Um, appreciate that intro. I, you should be seeing the slides now. Um, would someone mind just giving a thumbs up if you can see them? Okay, thank you. Uh, so like Hill said, today we're here to talk about our research code of ethics that we published I can't remember exactly when, but sometime in the last uh, couple of months at Human Impact Partners. And our research code of ethics is a framework for research that is rooted in building and sharing power with community and community organizers. So I am going to start by telling you a little bit about our organization, Human Impact Partners. Uh, we also go by the acronym HIP. We are a nonprofit public health organization based in the United States, and we were founded in 2006. And our mission is to transform the field of public health to build, to center equity and build collective power with social justice movements. We have a few different strategies to do this, including capacity building, policy-driven research, advocacy, and organizing. And we focus on multiple issue areas, including economic security, housing justice, climate justice, and the criminal legal and immigration systems. Our headquarters, our, our main office, um, is in Berkeley, California, in the San Francisco Bay Area, but uh, we have staff across the United States. So, uh, like I said, our research strategy is what we call policy-driven, and it's also community-centered. Our research evaluates health impacts and health inequities in order to support targeted campaigns and movements for social change. And our research really aims to center the experiences of communities who are most impacted by inequities and injustice. So the way that we do research is in partnership with community power building organizations. And our research is really intended to support our partners' policy aims. Our vision at HIP is that research in conjunction with advocacy, organizing, and communications strategies will build power within communities and community organizing groups to transform systems and policies to advance health equity and social justice. And I'm gonna pass it to Christine, who's gonna talk a little bit about our process for developing the code of ethics. Thanks, Alana. Um, yeah, so we started developing this code of ethics, um, I wanna say like two years ago, um, and then just released it in January of this year. Um, it was a really, collaborative process um, by how we did it. Uh, but let me start with why we did it. Um, so we started the process of making this code of ethics because um, many of our community partners that we were working with in our research projects uh, are either a part of themselves or work with 
um, marginalized communities that um, often have been historically and contemporarily mistreated and harmed by researchers. Um, so at the beginning of many of our research partnerships, our partners were coming into that relationship with some well-justified hesitations and a lot of questions um, about our research process. And so having you know, had that experience with partners and, and answering some of their questions around our process prompted us to develop the Code of Ethics. Um, and so to create it, we reviewed um, protocols from institutional review boards, um, a lot of which are at academic institutions um, that approve um, sort of the, the ethics part of research. Um, we looked through research consent forms, we looked through evaluation literature on community engaged research. Um, and we met with some of our research partners um, at the beginning of the process to ask what they would want to see in a research code of ethics and then again after we had drafted it um, to review it and then incorporate their feedback again. Um, and then all of our staff and board members at um, Human Impact Partners or HIP also reviewed the code. So it took a few years to like actually finally come together. Uh, Alana, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Um, so the purpose of our code of ethics um, is to introduce our partners uh, to our values as researchers, to address organizers' concerns about ethical research practices and to hold ourselves just internally accountable to conducting ethical, responsible, and engaged research. Um, and as Alana shared, our research is policy-driven. Um, so that means that it's always meant to create some action or some policy or systems change. Um, and we keep that goal at the center of our work always so that we don't fall into this trap of creating research just for the sake of creating research um but really to ensure that it can be used as a tool for action um, and so we have this little post-it note here on the slide that um we feel like really kind of captures the sum of that purpose um, which is from ruha benjamin from her book viral justice how we grow the world we want um, and she wrote we should ask ourselves whether research is serving as a stall tactic so that we never collectively act on what we already know when it comes to engendering health and well being, I refer to this as the datafication of injustice. Um, so, a lot of our research process is meant to um, not fall into that trap. I'll pass it back to you, Elena. So, um, for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to talk about each of our seven principles in our research code of ethics. And after I introduce each principle, Christine will talk about an example of the principle being applied in practice. So starting with the first principle, um, the first principle is that research should be done collaboratively and in close communication with partners. So we recognize that our positionality as external researchers means that we often have different intersecting identities and experiences than our research participants. And our core leading philosophy is that directly impacted communities are experts in their own lived experience. And they are the people who best know the solutions to the issues that affect their families and communities. So for that reason, for research, we partner with grassroots organizing groups who are in deep relationship with community. Our partners that we partner with for research are committed to community power building, policy and systems change. And they hold deep, deep, deep wisdom and expertise that we really wanna center in our partnership. And we also recognize that many communities have been excluded from decision-making processes that impact their lives. So we really aim to center and uplift these communities in our research uh, process. And Christine will talk about an example. Thanks. Um, yes, so as Alana shared, um, I'm gonna share about uh, one of our research projects, which was in collaboration with the Asian Prisoner Support Committee, um, which is based in California, and the Asian Americans Advancing Justice Asian Law Caucus, um, which is also in California. Um, and so we worked with them on this project. Um, they were building a campaign to pass a bill in California, which would end direct transfers from California prisons and jails. Um, to immigration and customs enforcement, or we call it ICE, ICE custody. Um, so often people were 
uh, getting released from prison or jail, um, you know, at the time they were supposed to be released. And then rather than being released back to their communities, um, the, the prison would call and notify um, immigration enforcement and they would come and pick them up and bring them to an immigration detention center. Um, so these partners were working on a bill to prevent those transfers from, from being allowed to happen. Um, so over the course of the seven months of this research project took, we met weekly with our, with our partners, um, and I'll be referring to them as ALC and APSC. Um, and weekly, we discussed the status of their campaign, of their policy campaign, um, and then also updated them on our research process and kind of traded some of that just to ensure that the research remained aligned with their campaign goals and strategies. Um, and then because we were meeting with them weekly, the ALC and APSC staff were deeply, deeply involved in informing um, the research scope, the methods we used, um, you know, the tools like the interview guides and, um, uh, you know, what, what questions we were asking by providing feedback um, on our drafts. Um, and then staff from the organization also sat in on the interviews that we did um, with impacted community members, which I'll share a little bit more about later. Um, and then again, just to like really reinforce this, this principle of being, you know, having close communication and total transparency, um, all of the organizers who were involved in the project uh, at APSC and ALC had access to the research data, had access to the literature review findings, um, they reviewed every research tool and every product uh, before we released it to the public. Back to you, Alana. Thanks, Christine. So the second principle is that research should interrogate unjust systems, be beneficial to communities, and support our partners' advocacy work to change policy and improve living conditions. So we believe at HIP that research should benefit the communities that we're working with and expose the systems that cause them harm rather than extracting data and narratives for the sole purpose of gaining knowledge as some research has done and continues to do. And so like Christine was sharing, we want our research to be immediately actionable to communities benefit. <clears throat> so in collaboration with our research partners, we propose policy solutions that are rooted in the lived expertise of those directly impacted. And we intend for our research products to be used to support these policies and shifts, shift narratives in order to advance health equity. So in practice, this means that we're really looking to our partners and their wisdom to define what would be most beneficial for the research project in terms of what question we ask, how we do messaging around the findings and how we disseminate the results. And another thing to note is that um, supporting our partners work often means that we are conducting knowledge to support local campaigns rather than striving to develop generalizable uh, knowledge. I'll pass it back to Christine. Thanks. Um, so here on the slide, you can see some of what um, the bill that they were trying to pass, which they called the Vision Act, um, was trying to do. Um, which again was to interrupt this this system by which people were transferred from prisons and jails into um, immigration enforcement detention centers. Um, and so part of how we enacted this principle in this project, um, our partners APSC and ALC identified the need for their campaign. Um, so what they wanted were research uh, research products that would communicate the negative health impacts of these transfers, um, specifically within Southeast Asian communities um, in the US. And so the products that we created targeted um, strategic audiences, we targeted policymakers, we targeted, um, yeah, targeted policymakers with a research brief that was specifically meant for um, governmental decision makers. And then we also created talking points in a social media toolkit um, that was meant to be used by advocates and by community members um, on social media and in calling policymakers um, and things like that. Uh, we also authored an op-ed um, for a newspaper. We wrote a blog post um, in conversation with the family members of a Vietnamese refugee who was transferred from a California prison to an ICE detention center uh, in Colorado. Um, and then once we finished creating everything, we brought our research materials to the governor of California, to his staff. Uh, we lobbied state legislators um, to discuss why ending 
ICE transfers or, or these direct transfers from prison to, to detention centers, um, why that was critical to advancing um, the health of individuals, of families, of communities, and um, promoting health equity. So those meetings often included a cross section of, um, of folks. So that included us, you know, people who are in public health, um, directly impacted people, people who had been transferred, uh, faith leaders, and more. Um, and then we, we've sort of done a lot with this particular project. So we also have done webinars, classroom lectures, blogs, um, social media, um, and really just mobilized our networks to help support this campaign um, for folks. Our third principle is that research should uplift and reflect people's lived realities. So um, at HIP, we do mixed methods research, though I would say we most often do qualitative uh, research. And so in terms of qualitative, by holding interviews or focus groups, we collect qualitative data that can help us shift narratives and amplify and center real human stories and experiences of those most impacted by injustice and inequities. And then when we do use quantitative methods, they can be helpful to understand broad trends and describe the scope of a problem. But for all methods, regardless of what methods we're using, we're careful to ensure that the data that we use are authentic to what participants share with us. And we're careful to communicate their lived realities in a way that allows participants to feel seen and represented in the work. And so as part of naming this lived reality, we aim to explicitly name racism and incorporate an intersectional framework to understand layered forms of systemic oppression. Christine? Yeah, so part of what um, we did for this project, uh, we, we did um, mostly qualitative research for this project. So we interviewed um, Southeast Asian folks who were formerly incarcerated themselves um, or who had experienced a transfer from prison or jail to ICE um, or had a loved one who was transferred. Um, so we did interviews of those folks. We also conducted a literature review um, and we included in that articles and blogs that were written by Southeast Asian Americans um, and specifically about what's here on this slide, which are um, the, the, the way that trauma just gets compounded at every step of the process um, of a transfer. So pre-migration pre trauma, post-migration trauma, um, which many of the folks that we talked to uh, experienced and, and talked about, um, and then the ways that the U.S. carceral system criminalizes that trauma. Um, and then we also analyze literature on the health harms of just incarceration in general and the way that those harms are compounded by transfers. Um, so that's kind of how we captured that for this project. So the fourth principle, I think, really builds on the third one. And the fourth principle is that research should respect participants and their stories and participants should have the authority to determine how their experiences are included. So what this looks like in practice is for research participants, we ask folks if they're comfortable being quoted in any published materials, and if so, if they'd like to choose a pseudonym or if they prefer to re remain anonymous. We also invite folks to opt in to being audio recorded and we remind folks that they can let us know if they end up saying something that they actually change their mind and they don't want it in the report and we'll respect that. Um, we also recognize that in many cases, our lived experience is different than that of our participants. So we wanna give participants the authority as to how they show up in the work. So what this looks like is us sharing drafts with participants to seek their feedback, input, and approval of quotes or summaries. And we also translate reports into participants' primary languages. Um, and in terms of our organizing partners, uh, they provide feedback on all research material and written summaries. And like Christine was saying earlier, they have equal access and ownership of all data and materials through the research process. Um, so one of the ways we did this in this project um, was throughout the whole process, we took steps to you know, make sure that participants could determine the way their stories were going to be used. Um, so during interviews, uh, we reiterated to folks that if they shared anything that they ended up not wanting us to include in the report, 
they could tell us at any time, um, either during the interview or after the interview at any point, um, and we would make sure that those statements were not included in the final products. Um, and then one thing we did with this report, uh, with um, the social media toolkit that we created, we can see some examples of that in the slides, um, was we had a local artist draw some portraits of uh, the folks that we interviewed and created these social media tiles with quotes from their interviews um, that we shared for a social media day of action. And so we had the participants choose what photo they wanted the portrait to be based on, and then they reviewed the portraits and the quote that we'd be using um, before they were ever shared publicly. So our fifth principle is that research should offer acknowledgement and compens compensation to community partners and research participants for their time and contributions to the work. We recognize that the time and energy they put into the research partnership is not free and that sharing stories and experiences is labor. Christine. Yes, um, so part of how we do this is we give a sub grant to our community partners always um, and that covers the time that they spend in meetings with us, with us, which is often weekly, um, and the time that they spend on uh, data collection efforts, um, you know, being a part of interviews and then reviewing drafted products. Um, so the subgrant for this project that we gave to our partners was ten thousand um, dollars. We just, yeah, try to make sure that that they're compensated for their time as well. Um, and then for interview participants, uh, all the interview participants got a $75 gift card um, and that amount um, our partners decided on based on what they felt uh, would be, you know, an adequate compensation for time while also not being um, coercive to, to having someone participate. Um, and then in terms of how we acknowledged folks in the final products, um, at the request of our partners on the project, they felt it would be more strategic for the brief to be solely authored by researchers at HIP. Um, and so often our, our partners will say that like it, it has more meaning if it's coming from like what's viewed as an external agency. Um, so we listed our partners on the acknowledgement page as collaborators rather than as co-authors. Um, and then we also recognized interview participants in the acknowledgement section for sharing their experiences and, and really just shaping the, the um, report. Our sixth principle is that research should give participants, participants the option to end participation at any time and for any reason. So for us, ensuring that our research participants feel comfortable is a top priority. Any research involving humans, of course, requires consent and our work is no exception to that. So we do informed consent and we also create space for participants to ask questions or express concerns about research, all in participants preferred language. And we also ask our community partners to review all research materials before recruiting any participants. Sometimes our research partners sit in on research activities like interviews or focus groups, or they may actually facilitate them themselves. And this is drawing from the understanding that our partners hold relationships with the community and we really wanna make sure that folks are comfortable. And finally, like we've mentioned, participants are told that they may stop participation at any time or skip any questions that they wanna skip no problem, no questions asked. Christine. Thanks. Um, so, so this principle was particularly important in this project because of the like very sensitive and traumatic nature of people's experiences with migration and incarceration. Um, so many of the folks that we talked to sh were sharing about deep, deep traumas about um, genocide in their home countries, fleeing as refugees to the US, um, and then the ongoing trauma of being a refugee in a new country, uh, and then in that being compounded by the trauma of being incarcerated, and then again compounded by, um, by these direct transfers um, and just being separated from their loved ones. Um, so we were very, very, very um, conscious of this principle throughout the whole process. Um, we did that by telling participants they could end, you know, when we were interviewing folks, letting them know they could end the interview at any time, that they could choose not to answer any questions they didn't want to answer. Um, 
And then none of the interview participants ever chose to end their interviews, but we did have um, several of them that we just, you know, paused at moments during the interview to give space for folks to um, express and feel their pain and just be held in community and recenter and um, having our community partners who held relationships with these folks prior to the interviews be there was really important. Um, and so they joined the interview calls and then they also followed up with participants after the interviews to check in on them and, um, you know, if they needed any additional support or resources to, to offer that to them too. And then back to you for our last principle. Thanks, Christine. Um, our seventh and final principle is that research should have follow-up beyond the completion of a project. So when the research project ends, that's not the end of it. We want to continue to check in with our partners reg regularly, and we remain available for ongoing support related to advocacy. This can look like a number of different things, including testifying at hearings, signing or writing letters of support, speaking to the media, leveraging our co connections in the world of public health, or more. And I'll pass it to Christine. Thank you. Um, so for this particular project, our partners have been super, super proactive and active um, with their ongoing campaign needs. So the bill didn't end up passing the year that we um, wrote this, and they're actually trying to repass it again this year. Um, so one of our staff was just at like an advocacy day at the um, state capitol for this um, just, the, just last week. Um, but we really just had an ongoing relationship with these folks that we worked with. So um, here you can see we we presented with them at the American Public Health Association conference in 2021. Um, we testified at a congressional oversight hearing that was about COVID-19 in California state prisons. Um, and we made a video, like our whole staff, you know, you can see in that middle one, our whole staff kind of joined in to make a video in support of the bill during a campaign to push it to pass. Um, we've done social media days of actions and, and on and on. So we've really just continued to stay engaged with these partners. I think that's it, Yeah. Right? Yeah, that is um, really it. So thank you so much for following along. Um, I'm going to put a link in the chat to our code of ethics. So in case you want to check it out, read more. Um, and thanks so much for following along. Thank you so much, uh, Christine and Elana, for that really interesting presentation and <clears throat> very powerful case study as well. And like the images and the quotes were very powerful, I thought. Um, we're going to now go to Jordi, uh, Menex economic justice campaigner, who I will um, pin now. Um, and um, Jordi is going to reflect kind of from an organizer's perspective on your presentation, um, on his experiences of interacting with researchers in ways that are, you know, sometimes positive if they're abiding by these kinds of principles and sometimes less so when they're not. Um, so just to introduce Geordie, who is is like modest and shy, but I'm gonna I've written him a bio. So uh, Geordie's Medex Economic Justice Campaign Lead. He's an experienced organizer who's previously worked with the small radical um, trade union International Workers of Great Britain, uh, mostly working with migrant workers to win better paying conditions. Um, and at Medex, Geordie has supported um, the Economic Justice Group members, some of whom are here today, to advocate for in-housing of outsourced workers, such as cleaners and security guards at um, NHS trusts, and to add the health voice to campaigns against damp and mouldy housing. They're working currently in North West London and Harrow, and has, of course, supported health workers who here in the UK have been on strike recently. So I'll pass it to you, Jordi. Thanks, Hill. Um, I had a few things to say, but now I have more questions and comments, but I'll try to start with the comments um so yeah um i think i'll mostly as I, I will mostly focus on the experiences as a union organizer mostly because of somehow unions have become really appealing and researchers especially academic ones love them um for, for whatever purposes um those are but um the, the union that uh, i organized with for 
for a few years it was a union that mostly represented uh, migrant workers uh, in in the traditional sectors um, such as cleaning security or more gig economy sectors such as delivery um, of private hard drivers etc um, I was a, a legal representative and an organizer mostly with outsource workers in in cleaning and security and uh, whilst working for for a union branch we would often be contacted by um, researchers who are interested in you know um, just learning more about our way of organizing and our campaigns and um, and understand like the dynamics of grassroots uh, organizations um, and I mean there were several things I, I think the first one was um, in a grassroots organization you're extremely overstretched you have very long capacity and you're trying to uh, put out uh, multiple fires at once um which means that when engaging with something external um you normally you know acknowledge the fact that you might not have a lot of time uh but it's not just that staff or those who are lucky to be paid don't have much time but also that members that you support uh, are also precarious workers themselves who work you know two or three shifts who might also not have time so obviously there's a set of questions that um would would normally um, we would normally ask, which were, um, are you going to offer any payment? Is there any, any financial side to your research? Which with a response that was normally no. Um, then next question would be like, would you help us with something given that we have limited capacity and that, you know, you would like at least get some research that would help you with, you know, with the purpose of your academic career, et cetera, which normally was, was met uh, by surprise. And obviously, the last question was, um, what would we gain with this research? And how would the research help us, you know, like win kind of materially and like locally? And also, this response was never met in a satisfactory manner. Uh, because obviously, there was a clear detachment from like the academic purpose of knowledge and the real purposes and needs that you have when you're like working on the ground, which normally means, you know, like trying to get a manager fired for bullying or you know, harassment of all kinds, or just trying to get a pay uplift, right? Um, so it's not so much that the knowledge that we under like th that we needed was like, you know, like the culture of grassroots organizing in the UK by like, like Latin American migrants. It was more we need to know the accounts and you know financial um, breakdown of the institution that we're targeting to clearly know where where to press them and where to put the pressure. Um, but I'll go back to the knowledge side. But normally, what we need is leverage, right? Um, we don't need a lot of knowledge that is detached from kind of the agents that produce it. In this case, you know, um, outsource workers, etc. Um, so yeah, I, I guess that's something that we're all familiar with, which was this extractivist approach um, um, that led to you know this this sort of kind of culture of of knowledge that is very much detached from from those who you know could benefit from it in in any way. Um, which, yeah, I guess makes makes me think, and especially when we're when you were chatting about uh, the kind of research as having a purpose of change and of of driving systems change. There's always this, this idea of like, what what is knowledge when it comes to research, and how is it really to kind of perpetuate a certain like elite and and, and a notion of power. Um, as opposed to a knowledge that actually reflects how people live, organize, and structure themselves on the ground. Um, and I think there was always a tension between someone extracting kind of information and then turning that into so, some sort of academic knowledge and research that allowed kind of the people producing it to be agents in the production of research and the production of knowledge. In this case, outsourced workers generated knowledge that provided them with a framework to understand like what kind of culture like do we generate when we organize in a grassroots model in a democratic model uh what kind of knowledge do we generate by accumulating different struggles against different institutions of of, of um uh with different you know uh tactics etc cetera, etc cetera. um which i guess like i would call one like tactic research and then you know when it's just like academic uh research and then one produces the knowledge which is based on on a, finding a common understanding, like how people kind of live and interact on the ground. Um, and we wouldn't, we wouldn't normally have a lot of offers on that side. Um, but something 
Yeah. And I guess there's that notion of knowledge, but then also the kind of the other idea, which is like, it would be beautiful to produce knowledge and to like provide a framework to the knowledge that people generate when they organize, um, especially in a kind of autonomous way on, on the ground. But then there's also the need to provide um, research that supports, as I said, leverage, right? Um, we did have good experiences whilst in the union uh, that mostly came from like very partisan organizations. One of them in the UK is Corporate Watch. If you don't know about them, they're great. Um, which they focus on doing financial research and investigations on companies, organizations that people are campaigning against. Um, and during our time there, they were really helpful in funding, you know, not only uh, financial information on institutions, for instance, once we asked them, like, could this university afford to bring their cleaners in-house when they're saying that they don't have the money? Um, and they just reviewed the accounts and concluded that they could, right? Uh, which gave us a, a very, a very simple argument. But also they would help us find, you know, of the personal assets of the board of directors, the, you know, their businesses, addresses, like potential personal connections with the outsourced companies, et cetera. Um, which obviously is very useful for the purpose of campaigning because it allows you to build a clear power map and targets, et cetera. Um, which is very useful knowledge that is connected to um, kind of real organizing uh, on the ground. Um, I, I'd rather leave time for, for us to interact because yeah, there's very good researchers here um, from the Economic Justice Group. Um, but I guess one, um, one last thing is, yeah, this, this, this notion of um, kind of the research and like how in the end when you're actually organizing the grant, you you do want the research to be a bit a bit of a partisan and to be political, mostly not just for them to agree with the goals that you have, which isn't always necessary, but rather to agree with a methodology of change uh, and an understanding of like power structures and how challenging power structures requires a specific type of knowledge that allows you to develop tactics. So knowledge on itself around like, you know, the way in which you organize is not sufficient. It, you also need to think of like what tactics are useful and what how tactics relate to a potential target, et cetera. Um, and in that sense, I think partisan researchers who understand that uh, notion of power and a notion of systems change is quite important. Um, so I, I love, I love, yeah, I think we'll go into this, but I, I love biased researchers. Um, <laughs> because they, they're really helpful in when, when they provide a, a clear, Cool for 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 to, that drives um uh, change, um, but I th I guess I'll stop there and then I'll just I'll just ask a lot of questions that I had from from that presentation, um, but thanks so much I I yeah I found found it really interesting I will just add one last thing which was because I, I I was surprised that I was shocked myself but when you said we follow up after research I was like wow that's so kind of you because uh, that never happens people just <laughs> do research and you support them for months and they just disappear. And when you sometimes ask them, like, oh, could you just, you know, support us with some, you know, um, tactic research that we're trying to do, they just, you know, vanish. Um, so it's, it's yeah, it's it's surprising that, that we're shocked when we hear about about principles like these ones that should be natural and obvious to all of us. But yeah, thanks for that. Thank you so much, Jordi, for that, uh, for that kind of contribution. Yeah, it's, it's um, uh, depressing, but like also affirming depressing to hear how familiar it is that people don't stick around but also affirming of yeah the need for the for hips code to, to kind of actually name that that is not okay and that things need should be done a different way and we're, we are hoping to try and uh yeah emulate that that different uh, approach in, in medx research um i'm going to stop the recording now because i don't think we want to record the q a